welcome to this Chatham House event on media, satire and politics. Now, everybody knows who Armando is, so he doesn't need much of an introduction. But I do think, uh, on a serious note, I do think we can say that he is one of this generation's Renaissance men. Now, Armando started, but as I understand, didn't quite finish a PhD on John Milton. Uh, but I'm told that during your time studying uh, uh, John Milton, you did come up with one hugely significant insight uh, into him. Uh -huh. And this is that the opening lines of Paradise Lost can be sung to the tune of the Flintstones. Uh, yes, I'm not going to sing it, but it's, uh, the opening lines are of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, and it goes of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, which is exactly the theme tune to the Flintstone. There it is, absolutely spot on. And when I learned that, I decided it was time to stop doing the <laughs> thesis and carry on with the comedy. <laughs> you can't better that. No. Um, so since, since then, Armando has gifted us Alan Partridge, Malcolm Tucker, and more recently, The Veep, which is the HBO comedy about the vice presidency of Selena Meyer. And I think you told The New Yorker, who did a, a big number about you and about The Veep, that during your preparations for the filming, you were shown around the White House by Barack Obama's body man, Reggie Love. And I think you were, you were slightly surprised when, instead of referencing each room to, this is where President Obama met Secretary Clinton, he'd say, this is where Josh sat, and this is yes. where uh, the other characters... He, um, he from, was from referencing the West Wing, and, and that, for him, was a bigger reality than... <laughs> Actually being in the actual West Wing, you know, where he was Josh and it, it just it, it threw the whole thing into perspective really. Yes, well obviously that's big responsibility on the shoulders of dramatic, dramatic writers <laughs> who uh, do these sorts of things. Now look, before we get going I thought uh, that I should mention some housekeeping. Uh, so the first is that this event is taking place at Chatham House but not under Chatham House rules. So it's on the record. Uh, and if you want to, you can tweet it at hashtag CHEvents. So I thought that before we sort of dive in mm. and discuss the essay question, which is media satire in politics, I thought it would be a good idea, Armando, really to get your overview of the political landscape. And by that, I mean sort of UK and the United States, really. And um, oh, obviously, yeah, I hope it's not going to be too depressing. This so, so <laughs> on that theme of satire, yeah. tell us about uh, Boris Johnson and uh, Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> OK. <laughs> What I'm interested in, are we living through an age of sort of... One of them's funny and politics? one of them isn't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I think uh, you're referencing... So I wrote something in the New statement, Statesman uh, a couple of months back about how, you know, when I watched Trump and I watched the, what was then the rise of Boris Johnson, and uh, he must be doing a Chatham House talk soon, mustn't he, Boris? Oh, Foreign he's probably Secretary? too grand for that. No? <laughs> All right. Um, I, I sort of felt, do you know, as someone whose natural inclination is to write comedy about the state of the political world, I feel I can't write jokes about this anymore because it's gone through funny, beyond the, the world of comedy and into the world of pain, really. And all I can do is what any individual can do is just try and campaign or express an opinion or uh, express opposition to or support for. Um, we've reached a kind of strange... We've, I mean, everything has gone topsy-turvy. We. The rise of Donald Trump and the rise of someone like Jeremy Corbyn and a little bit Boris Johnson reflects the fact that the less like a conventional politician you are, the more chance you have of succeeding as a politician. That's, that's the first thing. But they do it by, by adopting what to me seems like a kind of quasi-fictional persona. I mean, Boris worked really hard on the slightly ruffled, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what, I'm, you know, I'm just, because that felt human. And we, we kind of liked that because he didn't feel like, he didn't feel like a normal conventional politician. I mean, and that's quite fun, isn't it? Jeremy Corbyn rises because, you know, he, he, you know, he, he stuck to his principles and he just wear, he looks like he's wearing a loose-fitting jacket and occasionally wears a tie. And we like that because he's not being one of them. And similarly, Donald Trump's rise is because, you know, he says what he thinks. Even if it's barking mad, <laughs> at least it's not been through 100 focus groups and, you know, he's, he's undisciplined. And we like that. And George W. Bush, who I think is, you know, one of the worst presidents ever, won the presidency, technically, because <laughs> people thought he was a, the sort of guy you could have a beer with. That's, that's the phrase they kept using. And we've reached that point where, you know, in order to succeed politically, we've got to be as unpolitical as possible. Now, once you 
reach and arrive at that very contradictory state of affairs, you know, the, the whole game has been reset. You know, I think you have to think again about how you tackle something like that, how you portray it, how you make fun of it, or how you expose it. it you know, the, the rules have to be torn up and, and rewritten. But, but I wonder whether, um, maybe this is a bit unfair, are you being a bit defeatist? I think you said in that New Statesman mm. article that, that you know, it's not really the time for ridiculing if you want to change it. Mm. You should be reforming the system. I wonder whether that's a bit defeatist. And actually, when you have somebody like Boris Johnson, and yeah. there is a side of him that is completely fake. I mean, I remember when he was appointed to the front bench, to yeah. the shadow education position. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, shadow arts. And I remember I phoned him up and I said, uh, uh, Boris, uh, tell me about your, what, your, what your plans are. And he said, I've got 10 priorities. And he went through his priorities. And priority number six, he did this big, oh, I can't remember what that was. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. And then the next day, I wrote the story in The Guardian. My colleague wrote the story in The Independent. He said, it was astonishing that you wrote that, because he had the same mumble same, yes. at the same place. Yeah, 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 and yeah. I'm just wondering yeah. whether actually, with somebody like that, actually satire is more important than ever. And I think you, you quite admire oh, John Oliver in the US, don't you? Yeah, um, yeah. I'm not saying you should abandon it. I mean, yeah. I just think we have to be much more hardworking in how we <laughs> do our comedy. Yeah. Um, because, uh, I mean, you mentioned the fakery with Boris Johnson. You know, there's the someone going on, uh, is it Alan Johnson tonight in the documentary saying that actually Boris had told him he didn't want to win. He just yeah. thought he'd get kudos for running the Leave campaign. And, but he, he, uh, he hoped that it didn't win because there'd be, it, there'd be a mess to deal with. Um, but I think we felt that. We felt through the whole Brexit campaign that both sides were, a, were playing a game, were just adopting debating points. So we were told that um, you know, if we left the EU, we'd be able to pump billions into the NHS on a weekly basis by the Leave side. We were told by the Remain side, if we left the EU, the economy would crumble overnight and we'd have emergency budgets. So both of which, both of those have turned out to be untrue. And I think at the time, we knew it. And that's what's turned us off politics. That's why you know, we've, we've grown kind of rather numb to anything any politician says, because we just don't know we, we're, we're more persuaded that they're lying to us than that they're not. And, and I think what, what we've got to do in terms of the, the comedy world is, is be more alert to that. Be actually put a lot of work into um, you know, uncovering what factually is correct behind what someone says and what factually is inaccurate. John Oliver uh, and John Stewart on The Daily Show and, and, the, and this, all the surveys tell you that a lot of 18 to... 35-year-olds in, in America and also the UK, I think, get a lot of their news from the likes of John Oliver and John Stewart because they're providing a sort of journalistic service. And this raises questions about how effective the mainstream media has been in analysing what people say. John Oliver did a, a, a very good piece the other week about um, how we're in a sort of post-factual society. We're in a post-truth society where it's it's not about it's not about expounding policy and having command of details you know as as um, Michael Gove said you know we've had enough of experts we distrust experts and Hillary Clinton is criticized for having too many policies and too much experience we're, we're beyond that and and Newt Gingrich in an interview was saying crime is on the rise people don't feel safe anymore crime has gone up in America and the journalists were saying no it hasn't you know, if you look at the figures, crime has gone down in America. And he said, no, 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 it's gone up. And she said, no, it hasn't. It's gone down. Uh, and these are the figures. And he said, no, but people feel that it's gone up. And that's much more important. Now, why do people feel that it's gone up? We've got to do something about this. And it, it sort of typified what's happened in politics in that the language is all about emotions. It's about feelings. It's about sentiments. It's, it's like we don't, or politicians don't want us to look at the facts because the facts are, uh, can be tricky. They can be, they, they, they complicate matters. Uh, they can be dull. They can turn people off. Uh, and, and so it's actually now partly the role and or the responsibility of anyone who takes on politics, uh, whether as a journalist or a, politi or a comedian or a, a writer, to actually have to deal with the facts in a way. You know, spend a bit of time looking at the arguments and seeing where they make logical sense and have a, a, a spend a bit of time and energy researching the truth or otherwise behind what it is a politician says. I was interested what you're saying about uh, Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and the referendum. Yeah. Evidently, in, in his final days in the Commons, there are 
a few Brexiteers who went up to the Prime Minister. I heard of one who's the former Prime Minister who said, oh, I hope it's no hard feelings. Yeah. And evidently David Cameron said, oh, no, no, no problem with you. you. You really believed it. And then took out his phone and said, it'd be interesting if I ever reveal these texts that I've got with Boris Johnson, oh, uh, which wow. absolutely yes. makes your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're talking about sort of politicians saying things that may mm. not be true. Yeah. Uh, you gave the example of Newt Gingrich, and obviously mm. we had the Brexit referendum, where both sides, you know, the yeah. Treasury made all these big claims yeah. about what happened to the economy. Yeah. Uh, the Vote Leave campaign made these claims about yeah. the money that we would get back. Do you think the media is failing? Do you think we failed in that referendum? Do you think we were we were not doing enough to challenge those sorts of claims? I think claims? so. I think so. And you know, but also at the time, the BBC in particular was under a lot of pressure from the government. They'd just gone through the whole. Um, uh, charter renewal debate. John Whittingdale, the late John Whittingdale, um, wrote to the BBC saying, I hope you're going to be impartial through this referendum. So instantly, uh, you know, with, with the BBC's future at stake, what reporter is going to go out on a limb and do a report that attacks one side or analyzes in forensic detail one argument? And I think what you get then is, is the default position, which is if somebody says something outrageous, you don't, um, you don't question it. You just put someone else on who will say, say the opposite. And that way you're demonstrating fairness and balance and impartiality. Whereas, in fact, I think we, the viewer and the listener, feel that it's the duty of the broadcaster to, to pursue that person, to, to see whether argument has any strength, to see whether the things they are saying are factually accurate or correct. I think that's what we want to see more of. And, and I think we were turned off by the dullness of the, re the, the, the deliberate dullness of the def referendum debate, where people retreated to their, you know, their, safe, their comfort zone, which is let's just put two people on who are going to say the opposite of each other. Yeah. And then our job's done. Yeah. Yeah. And also, in, in the way that the media report things, you've also got social media which yes. was particularly sort of virulent in the Scottish referendum. Obviously, it was yeah. a factor, but... Yeah, but social media is a very... Social media is, is, is great at getting an opinion across. It's very good at you know, uh, connecting with your supporters. It's not very good at having a, a meaningful debate. Yeah. Um, it's because it's so self-selective. You know, you, you are being read by and tweeted by and followed by people who kind of agree with you, or if they disagree with you, are interested in you enough to want to know what it is you're saying. Um, so, so there's that. That's why I think actually things like this are very well attended. Literary festivals and festivals ideas are very well attended, and there are more and more of them, because people actually want to, they want to get something else. They want to get some more meat out of the conversation. They want to actually be able to physically see the person in the room and have a conversation with them. Um, I mean, that's why Jeremy Corbyn is having big crowds uh, attending, because people are, people are interested. Um, I think the problem with social media and, uh, is that it's, it's, if we have a social media politics, we end up with, I think, what is happening now, where parties are no longer, political parties are no longer broad churches where uh, lots of people are members who roughly share the same views on most things, but are allowed to have differences of uh, opinion on others. In a, instead, we get parties, political parties, that are self-selected sort of personality cults where, you know, we have the Jeremy Corbyn party, the Donald, the Republican party is the Donald Trump party at the moment, where the supporters are just enthusiastic supporters who will not countenance any opposing view. If you oppose Corbyn, then you're not really Labour. If you oppose Donald Trump, then you should leave the Republican party. Um, and, and similarly, you know, the Conservative Party has gone from being the David Cameron Party to the Theresa May Party. You know, she's changed it overnight, even though there's been no vote and no, you know, they probably haven't been consulted. Um, we have a whole new set of policies that nobody agreed on and everyone is rather surprised to see being discussed as if it's now the settled will of the people. And, uh, and, and my fear is, you know, these parties, these personality cults will rise and fall with the person at the head of them. So, you know, the, it's, it's no wonder people talk about the death of the Labour Party because it doesn't exist anymore. It's the Jeremy Corbyn party. Yeah. And, and the Tory party is now three or four different groups yeah. anyway. You know. And do you think those sort of silos that yeah. you have people who are in the Jeremy Corbyn view of the world and all they yeah. see on social media are 
their view of the world, the Donald Trump people, yeah. and they're not getting what you would have had in the analog era. Yes. They're not getting the overview. And so that maybe yeah. explains the real anger and hostility when they do hear a view that maybe Yeah, I mean, there's two, uh, there's two interesting theses to be written, uh, uh, if a thesis is interesting. But um, one is, the, you know, the impact of social media on politics, because there's a whole, uh, not just a generation, uh, but there's just a whole civilization that is now used to being able to select their personal favorites, whether it's music or whether it's on Amazon or whether it's you know Tesco deliveries or you know you 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 you, you make your own basket. And what's happening now is the idea of a political party with fifty different views on fifty different policies, some of which you agree with, some of which you don't agree with. It's becoming more and more difficult. More it feels too. It feels slightly old-fashioned. We're, we're used to that idea of just click the things you like. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, anything that is a you know, binary decision, like a referendum, becomes a bit of a kind of, uh, well, that's why that's what I want. So why don't I have it? You know, there is, it's almost like we, we, we so disbelieve our politicians that we actually disbelieve the effect of voting. Do you know what I mean? We don't actually, we're, we're not confident that a decision we make will actually have consequences. We're bound up by the, the process of making the decision and then we move on and make another decision. No, no, that decision you made now has consequences. Uh, and I think we're in that area where we don't feel it's real. And therefore, you know, why not vote Trump? Let's see what happens. Might be fun, you know. There's, <laughs> shake things up a bit. Uh, and we've lost that sense of, you know, how our dis decisions affect other decisions and interconnect with other communities and, you know, have a, have a knock-on effect. And the other interesting thesis, if I can go back to my... Um, bibliography of uh, a hypothetical thesis, is, is, is the impact that the decision to go to war in Iraq has had on credibility of politicians and credibility of Westminster. Because it was, it was a lie. And we all accept it was a lie. And yet it happened. And the consequences of that decision are still unravelling. And, and therefore, why should we trust people in the House of Commons to come to a sensible decision when examining the facts? I think that's had a profound effect on why people feel disconnected with, from the political discussion. Do you, do you think, in a sense, the Iraq war on, on both sides of the Atlantic, um, as you're saying, mm. the effects are much deeper than mm. we've perhaps realised. And it's, as you say, broken trust, but it's, it's basically broken trust not just in anyone who voted for the Iraq War, but anyone who looks like a sort of a career politician. Yeah. So it's difficult for Hillary Clinton, difficult for David Cameron. Obviously, Tony Blair is not going to yeah. recover from it. And it's only the politicians, Barack Obama, Jeremy Corbyn, mm. who either rejected it or weren't there, who yeah. sort of are, are, are therefore not obvious career politicians. Mm. Is that the sort of the tale? There is an element of that. And, and the worrying aspect of that is that we're then, we're now suddenly categorising politicians by, you know, one or two events in their lives or one or two decisions they make. Uh, and we've lost track of that sense of, you know, weighing up the pros and the cons and the, on the one hand this and on the other hand that. You know, they, they, you know they, they're, they're having a discussion and an argument uh, about whether something, you know, it's, we've lost that. Everything is now this binary decision we make, you know, and it's become a very easy label to attach to someone. Uh, whether they voted for this or whether they didn't, you know, and uh, I think, I think, but my only, I, I, as I said at the start, I hope this isn't going to be a depressing evening, I sort of think that, I mean, I think there is hope in that, you know, the, in terms of the public's appetite to get to the truth and to actually have a proper discussion, I think that is still there. I think, I think we're frustrated, but we're hungry for some kind of decent conversation about these issues. So we'll go elsewhere, whether we come out, as you've done, thank you very much, tonight, or go to an event or a public event, or whether we have to be more active in how we use the internet and how we try and find out for ourselves or find, as I think will happen eventually, a service on the internet that, that that's, that's has the resources to start examining the truth or otherwise of something a politician has said or whether something is factually accurate or not. And presumably, if, if you, as you say, people have that hunger for truth, presumably, I mean, we're not going to have a referendum for a long time, but presumably what the Scottish and the, mm. uh, the EU referendum showed is that presumably the, 
politicians, both sides, have got to be more responsible and not make the sort of wild claims on both sides. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because there's that hunger. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that, you know, I, I think people in, in both referenda thought that they were being given that referendum as a bit of a sop. And they're both from Cameron, in fact, you know. But we'll, we'll allow the Scots to vote on, on uh, independence. We'll have a, an EU referendum. It was part of a game. Mm. It, was, it was a ploy. It yeah. was, we'll have that, they'll vote now, it'll be fine. Yeah. And then that's done. Yeah. Um, and, and I think even, I think there would be a, resi there, is a re there was a re residual percentage of the vote. Uh, people voted with a little hint of irritation that they were being made to vote. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that, that, they, you know, that the politicians felt that it was much easier to foist the decision on, on us rather than to face up to the decision themselves, especially in the EU referendum. Um, and I think that resentment yeah. came through in, in the final result as well. Now, on this theme of sort of a lack of trust in our politicians, yeah. we, we were saying that perhaps it's, you know, the result of the Iraq war, it's Tony Blair and all that. But there yeah. is a school of thought that says it's not Tony Blair. It's the, it's the, it's the fault of irresponsible dramatists mm. who presented the idea that you could have somebody who's close to the prime minister going round and effing and blinding his way round yeah. Whitehall. And that's a, a grossly unfair and distorted view of how yeah. our great nation is governed. <laughs> and it's all your fault. It, um, I'd accept that. It's, uh, no, it's... <laughs> look, well, first off, it's a, you know, we, I mean, it's a comedy. It's a, it's a fiction. Uh, it wouldn't be very funny to portray a politician sitting by the desk um, answering uh, constituents' letters all day. <laughs> Um, which I'm sure is what a lot of them do. And, and you know, I have an enormous affection for the political process and a lot of admiration for people who go into politics because they want to achieve something. Um, I, I think what we were saying in the thick of it was that politicians unfortunately allow themselves to be guided by so many internal and external pressures. Um, and also, we, the electorate, you know, demand too much of our polit polit politicians. We expect them to be perfect. They're not allowed to, you know, accidentally chuck in a receipt for dog food in amongst their expenses. They're not allowed to go on holiday, um, you know, when a, when there's a bus strike. They're not allowed, you know, they're they're not allowed to earn any money. Um, uh, you know, we put that pressure on them, and they feel they can't argue back. They they feel they can't say, "Are you just idiots?" No one can function under those circumstances. <laughs> you know, we're human beings. They're not allowed to say that. Um, so that's what about. Also, you know, the number of people who have said, you know, the thick of it portrays politics in a very exaggerated and um, negative light. The number of people who have said that has been outweighed by the number of politicians who have come up to me and said, you know that event that happened in the thick of it? It, the reality has been so much worse, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, you know, and I also think it's up to, to you know, the political classes to demonstrate why, if they think, think it's got it wrong, to demonstrate why they got it wrong, yeah. why it got it wrong. Now, what, what's interesting, obviously, is the obvious comparison between, obviously, uh, the thick of it and yes minister, yes prime mm. minister. Mm. And the, the political class loved Yes P Minister yeah. and Yes with pr Margaret Thatcher appeared in an That's episode and Jim, they loved it. Jim Hacker is trying to get on with his job and, yeah. and, and, and you know, yeah. means well and it's the, you know, it's, yeah. it's a Humphrey who's stopping him. Yeah. But actually, you know, in the, in the thing of it, I think actually, <laughs> to speak personal experience, but I, I, I actually warm most to the minister. I, yeah. I yeah. feel most yeah. sorry yeah. for the win. I think... Um, you know, he or she are, are the most human of the lot of them. Yeah. And it's the people they surround themselves with saying, yeah. oh, no, you mustn't do this. This will look, um, you know, say you like shortbread because if you say any el anything else, yeah. you know, that we'll, we'll have the Jaffa Cake Society on us. And, you know, um, it, it's that. Or, oh, my God, somebody's mentioned this. Well, we ought to put out a statement denying it. Yeah. It's, the, it's, the, it's the panic yeah. in this sort of little echo chamber that they've stuck themselves in. And actually... You know, that was my feeling. I don't think... And we never actually showed corruption. We didn't say politics are corrupt, they're venal, they're self... You know, we didn't... It wasn't about that. It was about how the process has got to this stage where 
it's so been overtaken by trying to respond to 24-hour events mm -hmm. that there is no time to just sit down and, and gather your thoughts and make a considered decision about something. And, and do you think the sort of the, the, the great success of both of them in their different ways is that they had one simple sort of eternal truth? The yes minister eternal truth was it's the civil service that probably run the show. Yeah. And, the, and that was perhaps right for that era. Yeah. And the eternal truth of the thick of it, which was right for that era, is basically you had this rampaging, unelected political figure mm. um, effing and blinding his way around Whitehall. Well, it, who represents the control of yeah. Downing Street yeah. over every other ministry, yeah. Yeah. which is something that's got... Uh, far greater in the last 10, 15 years. Um, the, 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 the fact that the cabinet isn't, uh, you know, that the prime minister isn't a first among equals. He's just, he's, he's, the, he's first and only. Yeah. Or she is first and only. Yeah. Um, for example, you know, Theresa May coming up with grammar skills wasn't in any election manifesto, wasn't in her leadership campaign. <laughs> But somehow we seem to accept that a new prime minister can entirely change government national education policy overnight, without question, um, you know, whether it succeeds or not. But and, and, and a year after the previous prime minister tried to change government policy by saying every school should be an academy that no one had discussed in an election. And that's because we've reached this strange position constitutionally where the prime minister... Um, commands and controls everything. Absolute power, provided they have a majority. Absolute power yeah. resides in yeah. number 10. Which, which isn't even something that happens in America, where you, know, you have a powerful president, but so many checks and balances there that you know, every president leaves office complaining about the things that they haven't managed to do because they couldn't. Um, and we don't have that here. So on that theme of how uh, you as a satirist are responsible, res entirely responsible for the uh, lack of trust the in our politics of uh, today, <laughs> can, can I just ask that in an era of sort of populists on both left and right, yes. you know, what Donald Trump does brilliantly is he is the outsider, even though he's worth billions. Mm. And the danger is that if you satirise him, you just strengthen that. And for example, oh, yeah. Barack Obama did that brilliant takedown of him at the White House Correspondents' Dinner yeah. a few years ago, mocking him on the birthers yeah. uh, movement. And everyone said, oh, that, is, that just shows why he's never going to be the Republican nominee. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And that actually antagonised him so much that he thought, yeah. I'm going to stand. Yeah. No, I think, you know, I think... It, it, madness lies in the assumption that by satirizing something, you're going to change people's views on it. I mean, it just doesn't happen like that. And I think it's a, it's, it's a crazy despotism to think that that's what you can achieve, you know. I think, you know, at, at its best, satire can help people crist crystallize or articulate opinions that they already have. But I don't think... I don't think it's there to change people's views. I mean, if that's what you want to do, you should either go into politics or you should go into journalism or you should campaign because you're not going to, you know, you're not going to win elections by telling jokes. Um, where Trump has succeeded is he's a, he's he's an entertainer. He's he's got through this <laughs> factual and truth barrier by really presenting himself as. I mean, he is thoroughly entertaining to watch. You know, I I always watch Donald Trump on television thinking, I'm going to hate this guy, and actually for the first two or three minutes, <coughs> loathing him. Ten minutes in, quite enjoying his strange presence. <laughs> Forgetting that also he's running to be president of the United <laughs> States. <laughs> uh, because he's a salesman. He's a yeah. very effective salesman. So what he say, says is sales pitch. It's, 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 it's tactics, it's debates. It's, uh, and, and if he says something outrageous, he, he, he's allowed to say afterwards, well, I was only joking. Do you not get sarcasm? <laughs> you know, <laughs> which, which any other conventional politician is not allowed to do. You know, you, you, people can't say, let's bomb Russia, and then go, well, I, wasn't, I didn't mean let's bomb Russia. Yeah. Only the you, president but, can say but, that. But, but you are the president. <laughs> I know, but I didn't actually. Um, you know, that's his kind of trick. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I hope that, 90 minutes of being asked detailed questions about policy next week might mm. show him up for how incapable he is of getting his mind across all that. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's the, that's the disturbing... Um, that's the disturbing conclusion that, that we've reached with Trump, is that, you know, yeah. you can get away with it. If you present yourself as just a bit of fun, 
and, and, and actually, you know, don't, don't take this seriously, um, you can somehow get away with it. I want to open up the floor, but just yeah. very briefly, I just want to pick up one thing you were saying, which is if you want to change the world, don't be a satirist, go into politics or journalism. I mean, didn't the sort of the pioneers of, satiris, uh, uh, of satire 40, 50 years ago, didn't, I mean, that was the week that was. That, that, that ended was the journalism. age of difference. It yeah. ended, ended the age of That's difference, That's right. Didn't it? But yes, but it was also journalism. Right. I mean, quite a lot right. of that was, the, was actually, uh, uh, you know, investigations. Yeah. Private Eye is a kind of an investigative magazine yeah. as well as a, a satirical magazine. Yeah. And um, I think those, you know, those are very valid. And, and that's why the likes of John Oliver, uh, John Stewart, The Daily Show, Bill Maher, um, have an impact because they don't just tell jokes. They work hard uh, with a mm. team of researchers and mm. uh, just coming up with an argument or taking down someone else's argument. 